when he reached the offices. The director was already at his desk. Behind him, in the corner, like a shadow, a KGB officer was sitting in a complete silence. Today you will learn more about the complexity of Soviet internal affairs. You will hear about new characters in this story and what they did. And hopefully, you will understand how the whole Soviet rotten colossus tried to stand up against the disaster that no one expected. We're getting slightly back in time overall, but I'm picking up the subject of the first hours after the disaster happened. Almost exactly where we finished last time. Many of these events were going on simultaneously, so if you'd have any questions, feel free to ask. And if you want to hear the previous episodes, check out the People of Chernobyl playlist. You don't need to watch them now, but it will surely give you a better context. This time, there will be no summary. Sorry. We're just getting into the episode. Let's start. The People of Chernobyl Part 7 When Moscow woke up It has been about an hour after the explosions at Chernobyl happened. Chief of the general staff of the Soviet army didn't suppose he would get a call so late. It was a dispatcher from the Ministry of Defense. Marshal Sergei Akromiev didn't want to hear the message. Explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant possible radioactive contamination. Release into the atmosphere not confirmed. It was 1996 and the tensions between the US and the USSR were a bit milder than in the previous decades, let alone in the 1950s. Nonetheless, the fear of an allied attack on the Soviet Union was still alive. After years of supporting the DRA, Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, Finally, the USSR sent troops there in 1979. It may have been over six years, but the fight was still going on and the US supported their rivals. Could it be possible that the Americans finally drew the first blood? Was it an attack on such crucial infrastructure? Could that be an undercover sabotage? These thoughts probably rushed through Akromeyev's mind like a flood. Despite the terrifying news, the marshal's first decision was to send a duty officer to gather as much information as he could. At the same time, he summoned all the general staff for a meeting. An hour later, when Akromiev arrived at his headquarters, there were still no updates on the situation. But the situation couldn't handle idleness. Without any more information, he began giving orders. But there was another problem. One of the most important people was not present at the meeting. The head of the USSR's civil defense was responsible for commanding the troops which were involved in protecting civilians if a natural disaster, chemical attack, or a nuclear war broke out. But he was gone, attending a conference in Lviv in western Ukraine. Somehow, Akromiev reached him via phone and gave instructions. There was a nuclear accident in Chernobyl. Deploy the mobile reconnaissance unit stationed in Kiev immediately. Knowing what the risks could be, Marshall didn't wait. He commanded the special brigade dedicated to dealing with radioactive contamination to gear up and travel to Pripyat as fast as they could. They were based east of the Volga River, so Akromiev arranged air transport too. He made sure that all he knew at this moment was passed on to Colonel General Boris Ivanov deputy commander of all civil defense forces in the USSR. As any seasoned leader, especially when dealing with army forces, the marshal knew that when you can't gather enough information through the regular channels, you need to act. The initial plan was to deploy troops under his command according to the existing plans. The main goal was to protect the workers and nearby population. His staff was trained specifically for these kind of events. Even if that was just an accident, not an attack by a foreign power. Then, he left Moscow to lead the operation on the ground. 
At the same time, Boris Prushinsky was trying to get his head around what happened. When the duty operator gave him the decoded incident report, Boris asked for a direct line to the power plant. Ten minutes have passed in almost total silence. Prushinsky was impatiently waiting for someone from Chernobyl to call him. His thoughts were circling around multiple scenarios. What was the scale of the accident if half of the country was woken up and the phone lines in every ministry were either closed or busy? What if that was a malfunction of the cooling system? What if the radiation is getting out? What if that was a sabotage? Is the reactor intact? What about workers? Why isn't there any news about the workers? The waiting felt like a lifetime. Suddenly, the phone rang. A shift supervisor from Chernobyl called him, but couldn't provide Boris with the necessary information. The power plant worker said that the reactor had been shut down and the water was still being pumped into the core to prevent overheating. Yet, nobody at Unit 4 in Chernobyl nuclear power plant was answering the intercom. Instead of simple, there are no casualties, Prushinsky heard only, there is no word in casualties. A detail, but a significant one. Boris did what he was trained to do and what he was assigned to do, as the leader of OPAS, hung up the uninformed technician from Chernobyl and started giving orders. First, he wanted all 18 members of his team assembled at once. OPAS, they recently formed a unit which had a single purpose, investigating nuclear accidents as a first response team, was in front of their first such important task. His second decision was to call a friend of his, Georgi Kopczynski. Kopczynski was working as deputy chief engineer in Chernobyl for three years, so he knew not only the place itself, but most of the staff too. If you know the history of the power plant, you probably heard the name Dyatlov. When the accident happened, Dyatlov was holding the same position Kopczynski had in the past. Georgi was in Moscow at the moment. Party leaders acknowledged his expertise and called him some time ago to serve the Central Committee of the Communist Party, one of the highest authorities in the USSR, as a senior advisor on nuclear power. What Prushinsky said to him was crushing. There was some kind of explosion. The Unit 4 is in flames. Kopczynski, who knew the power plant well, could have suspected what the cause was. He called his supervisor, Vladimir Marin, the Communist Party's nuclear industry chief. That was one of the first moments the Central Committee learned and acted upon hearing the news. Marin decided the committee should gather at their headquarters as soon as possible. In the meantime, members of OPAS traveled through the calm night of Moscow, and when they quickly gathered, they started to plan immediately. They had to coordinate their actions and response to the accident with different ministries and departments. The Ministry of Medium Machine Building, which name had nothing to do with its real purpose, which was to develop the Soviet nuclear program. The Ministry of Health, with its special department in Moscow dedicated to reacting to nuclear and radiation incidents. State Committee for Hydrometeorology, which monitored the weather and environment across all Soviet Union. They were all notified and gathering. Each ministry and each department entangled in this situation had their own experts and procedures. But this time, the accident was more serious. They didn't know how much yet. But everyone felt that somehow their life can change within a second. The machine of Soviet bureaucracy, clandestine operations and politics started. At the same time, Kopczynski took a small briefcase and immediately called a car to get to the offices of Soyuz Atomenergo on Kitaisky Lane. When he reached the place, the director was already at his desk. Behind him, in the corner, like a shadow, a KGB officer was sitting in a complete silence. In Chernobyl nuclear power plant, no one in charge could be reached. There was no response. As always, I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's sometimes hard to introduce new characters into the story 
especially some of them appear only for a short moment. Nonetheless, a lot of them are necessary to be included so you could understand for example how the Soviet system worked. Meaning, how many people had to be involved, how the information was classified or how the reports were calming instead of making the matter urgent. A lot of people saw only a fraction of the whole picture and it was the mandate of them to harness the accident. That's the real tragedy behind the Chernobyl disaster. I hope you have learned something new today and you will wait eagerly for the next episode. For now, the plan is to jump a bit forward into the story and focus on Sherbina and Legasov again. But it might change during the preparation of the next scenarios, so don't mind if it will be something else. Either way, I will make sure it's going to be a nice transition between what you know already and what I want to tell you about in the future. Leave a comment and share this video with other stalkers. Ask us any questions if you only want to. Check out our game, Chernobylite, if you want to feel the sci-fi version of the Exclusion Zone. That's it for today guys. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week. <laughs>